Good morning, everyone. I'm Saurabh Paliwal from Biocon Invest Relation Team. And I'd like to welcome to the third quarter of f I would like to indicate that all participants will be in the listen only mode, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions after the opening remarks conclude. If you need to raise questions, ask questions, please raise, please select the raised hand option under the Zoom application reaction tab. You will call out your name and unmute your line to enable you to ask a question. When asking a question, please limit uh, your questions to two, and please state your name and organization before asking a question. I'd also like to bring to your attention that this conference call is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website within a day, and the transcript will be available subsequently. To discuss uh, this quarter's business performance and future outlook for the company, we have on this call today our group CEO, Mr. Peter Baines, Mr. Siddharth Mittal, CEO and Managing Director, Biocon Limited. Mr. Sheha Stambe, CEO and Managing Director, Biocon Biologics, along with other senior management colleagues across our business segments. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone about the safe harbor related to today's call. Comments made during the call may be forward looking in nature based on management's current beliefs and expectations. They must be viewed in relation to the risks that our business faces that could cause our future results, performance, or achievements to differ significantly from what is expressed or implied by such forward-looking statements. After the end of this call, if you need any further information or clarifications, please reach out to the Investor Relations team. With this, I would like to hand over the call to Mr. Peter Baines for his opening remarks. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Sarab. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining this call. I'll start with a broad overview of the consolidated group financial results before discussing each of the business units in more detail. Total group revenue for the quarter was rupees 4,519 crore, up 50% year over year. This growth was supported by income from divestiture of two non-core branded formulation India business units in Biocon Biologics for 350 core and a gain from Biocon stake dilution in Bicara Therapeutics for 456 core. Revenue from operations increased by 34% to 3,954 core, with biosimilars revenue growing 65%, research services growing by 9%, and generics declining by 7% year over year. Core EBITDA for the quarter stood at 983 core, reflecting a group core operating margin of 27%. It's important to note here that core EBITDA excludes the impact of asset and stake sales, uh, as I just described, and of course, R&D. R&D spend stood at 329 core, corresponding to 11% of revenues, excluding Syngene. Group EBITDA for the quarter was up 106% at 1,492 core versus 723 core last year, with an EBITDA margin of 33%. Excluding the two non-recurring items, Group EBITDA for the third quarter stands at 686 core, with a margin of 18% as compared to 24% last year. Depreciation, amortization, and increase and interest increased by 260 core year over year to 681 core, primarily associated with biosimilars business acquisition costs. Consequently, profit before tax and exceptional items stands at 787 crore, up 220% from 256 crore last year. Reported net profit for the quarter before exceptional items stands at 644 crore as compared to 140 crore in the previous year. I want to note here that we recorded a net exceptional gain during the quarter of 16 crore. This is net of tax and minority interest. This exceptional gain com 
comprised of a gain on carrying value of an existing contractual receivable arrangement, which was offset by impairment of intangibles associated with a product in certain territories and some inventory vision and transaction costs related to the Viatris transaction and the Stellis facility acquisition. This gain contrasts with a loss of rupees 182 crore last year and consequently reported net profit after exceptional items now stands at 660 crore as compared to a loss of 42 crore last year. And finally, as part of our efforts to reduce debt, we've repaid $200 million of biosimilars acquisition related debt. Let me now turn to the business sec sec segment and start with generics. The generics business reported an operating revenue of 703 crore, delivering sequential growth of 4% while declining 7% year on year. The business performance for the segment reflects a generic formulations component, which is showing consistent and steady growth and the API business, which is affected by market dynamics of pricing pressure and variable uptake, resulting in a lumpiness in performance. Core EBITDA for the quarter was 154 core with a margin of 22%. Profit before tax stood at 50 core, representing a PBT margin of 7%. Moving to the generics business updates, let me start with product approvals. And here I'm pleased to report that we've received our first generic product approval in China for mycophenolate sodium. This approval paves the way for the entry of our products into this large and strategic market. In addition to this, we have also received four product approvals across API and formulations, including one approval in the United States, one in the UK and two in most of world markets. Moving on to an update of our manufacturing programs, I'm pleased to report we've made good progress in our investment in new platform capabilities and capacities to underpin future growth. During the quarter, the company's Greenfield Immunosuppressants Facility in WISAG received a Certificate of Suitability or CEP from EDQM, the European regulator. We now expect the facility to be inspected and subsequently qualified for commercial supplies by other major regulators in the next fiscal. These new approvals, as they are received, will help build upon the established scientific and commercial capabilities of Biocon in fermentation products and help address the growing demand for immunosuppressants across global markets. Also, during the quarter, our Peptides API facility in Bangalore successfully completed process validation activities. As the business model of Biocon Generics evolves in the coming years, we expect peptides and particularly GLPs to play a major role as a future growth driver. In Hyderabad, process validation of products has begun in our new and modernized synthetic API facility. As we approach the close of the current fiscal, the business performance will remain a balance of API business lumpiness underpinned by sustained performance in generic formulations supported by recent co contract wins and upcoming product launches. Let me now move on to Biocon Biologics. And let me start by providing an update on the integration of the acquired business in Viatris. During the quarter, we completed the operational integration in more than 30 European countries, Japan, Australia, and remaining emerging markets. With this, we have now successfully completed the full transition of the acquired business in about 120 countries, fully one year ahead of schedule, to become a globally scaled and vertically integrated lab to market biosimilar enterprise. Turning now to the business performance and starting with the United States. 
In the first quarter post-integration, our products have maintained momentum and shown resilience in the dynamic market environment. Fulfiller, our biosimilar Pegvilgastrin, demonstrated continued strength with 80% market share in November, while Ogivri, our biosimilar Trastuzumab, has been resilient with a market share of 12%. Reported market share for our biosimilar Glargine continues at 12%. However, these numbers do not capture the uptake of our unbranded Glargine through a closed-door pharmacy network. New wins during the quarter included three contracts for Fulfiller, including a sole source contract with a large GPO organization, and three contracts for Ogivery, including a large GPO arrangement. We also secured two contracts for unbranded biosimilar Adalimumab commencing this month. Turning to Europe, and here our products have made steady gains. The quarterly market share of Fulfiller has grown to 8% against 5% last year, and Abevmi, our biosimilar Bevacuzumab, has grown to 6% against 1% last year. In emerging markets, the highlight was the launch of Abevmi in Brazil, with an originator market opportunity of $175 million. This was a landmark launch being the first major launch post-completion of the integration of the acquired business. Now coming to the financials of biologics, um, <clears throat> the revenue from operations were rupees 2,483 core, up 65% year over year. On a sequential basis, the growth stood at 26%. As mentioned last quarter, we divested two non-core branded formulations India business units to Iris Life Sciences, aligning with our global product focus. This has led to an increase in operating income for the quarter by 350 core. Excluding revenues from, from the divestiture, the sequential growth stands at 8%. This translates into a core EBITDA of 587 core with a margin of 28%. This margin is lower than our guidance of mid-30s on account of the series of integration-related expenses and one-off costs. Adjusting for these, four EBITDA margins would be 5% higher. EBITDA margins for the quarter was 29% with R&D investments at 11% of revenues. Profit before tax stands at 196 core. Debt reduction and strengthening of the balance sheet remains a continued focus for the company, and we are pleased to report that during the quarter, we received $220 million from an existing contractual receivable arrangement, $200 million of which were used to reduce our acquisition-related debt. With this pay down, Net debt at Biocon Biologics, excluding structured financing instruments, reduced to $1.2 billion. And overall, at the Biocon group level, net debt now stands at $1.1 billion. Moving on to Biologics regulatory updates. And following the receipt of marketing authorization for yes, our biosimilar Aflibercept in the European Union, we have also received marketing authorization from the UK's MHRA in November. In the United States, we have been in litigation with the originator for our biosimilar Aflibercept, where the court issued a mixed decision in December 23. And as a next step, we will now appeal at the West Virginia court's decision on the 865 formulation patent. On the clinical front, we have initiated our phase three studies for our biosimilar pertuzumab, advancing and continue to engage with the FDA had progressions regarding our Malaysia OAI status and biosimilar ASPART BLA. The next step we have 
received a CRL from the USA for a Bevacus as the agency was not able to visit the site for a pre-approval inspection. To reiterate here, the CRL did not identify any outstanding scientific queries on the dossier, and we continue to engage with the agency to facilitate an inspection at the earliest possible opportunity. In summary, this has been an extraordinarily busy quarter for the biologics business, completing the transition and integration, as well as maintaining robust business continuity. We see strong demand continuing for our products across the markets and the opening up of the Adali Muma biosimilar market, along with the regulatory approvals for biosimilar Aspart and Bevacuzumab to come would be additional key growth drivers. Debt reduction and strengthening our balance sheet remains a key focus. Let me now move on to an update on our novels biologics segment. And here are Boston-based Bicara Therapeutics successfully closed $165 million Series E financing in December 2023. With this latest close, Bicara has to date cumulatively raised 355 million from a syndicate of biotechnology investors. As a result of Bicara's of fundraise, Biocon recorded a gain of 456 pool in the consolidated PL statement during the quarter, mainly arising for the fair valuation of its holding in line with the Series C financing. Biocon shareholding in Bicara is now reduced to 14%, and as such, Bicara ceases to be an associate company for the Biocon group. Finally, coming to Sinjin. In Sinjin, revenue from operations for the quarter was up 9% over last year to 854 crore, cool, with reported EBITDA up 5% to 261 pool with an EBITDA margin of 30%. Profit before tax was 142 pool, up 1% over last year. Sinjin's performance during the third quarter was affected by reduced funding in the US biotech segment, which impacted demand in its discovery services division while dedicated centers and development and manufacturing divisions perform well. In manufacturing services, Sinjin's long-term biologics manufacturing partnership with Oasis continued to make good progress. During the quarter, Sinjin concluded the acquisition of the multimodal biologics manufacturing facility from Stellis Biopharma, and once Operational, the applied facility will add 20,000 liters of biologics drug substance manufacturing capacity to Sinjin's existing capacities. The acquired facility also includes a commercial scale high speed fill finish unit, providing an essential capability to Sinjin for drug product manufacturing. The facility is expected to be operational in the second half of. FY25, subject to regulatory approvals. In summary, the highlight of the quarter has been the completion of the transition and integration of the acquired biosimilars business. The sustained momentum for its product portfolio across markets augurs well as it focuses on improving market penetration of its commercial products launching new molecules and working to reduce debt. The generics business is making progress on expanding its portfolio and geographic reach, as well as strengthening its manufacturing base, both for today and for future growth opportunities. Syngen continues to form well, driven by development and manufacturing services, and the demand environment in the US biotech segment is expected to recover over the next quarters as the funding environment normalizes. And with that, I'd like to conclude my opening remarks and now open the floor to questions. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, we'll wait for the questions to December. 
As a reminder, please re use the reaction tab at the bottom of the Zoom application uh, to ask a question. We'll get the first question from Niham Anpuria from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Saurabh. Uh, hi, Peter. Thanks for the opening remarks. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first, I missed your comment on uh, a flibbercept. Uh, the line wasn't very clear at my end. Um, you know, if you could just tell us, you know, the next steps that Biocon is looking at, uh, you know, in terms of a flibbercept, um, and this it could this still be an opportunity, uh, you know, for us given our first to filing status in the product? Sure. Uh, hi, Ne. Uh, th and thank you for the question. Um, let me ask. Shri has, if he'd like to answer that, please. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Neha, thanks for your question. As you know, that, um, that at this point, uh, we uh, are evaluating all the options available to us, and uh, certainly App Appeal is one of the options that we are looking at. We are confident about the, uh, the position that we've got, and uh, as we progress this, we will update you um, on the next steps. Understood. Thank you so much. Uh, my, you know, second question is, you know, on the uh, BBL business, we have seen traction, uh, you know, in terms of revenue, uh, you know, quarter on quarter. Uh, you, you did seem to indicate a lot of contract wins uh, across products. So is it fair to assume, even though there is still uncertainty on the approval timeline for Aspart and Beva, um, you know, what should be the traction of the biosimilar revenue? Uh, that's number one. And second, uh, you know, when will that start reflecting in terms of margins? Because, you know, we have these one-off costs uh, for a while now. When do when do we start seeing that one-off cost getting sort of annualized and uh, seeing a clean uh, number in BBL going forward? Yes, again, you take that. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, I think that's a very fair question. I think what Peter alluded to in his opening comments was we've just come off a very massive global integration uh, 12 months ahead of schedule. So clearly it's been a, a huge focus right now to integrate and go from being present in two countries to being present in uh, 120 countries or so. So I think that's been really the focus. And as we've um, done that, we've made sure that business continuity <coughs> was the top focus. And that's what you've seen us uh, do. Market mm -hmm. share for all products across have continued uh, to, to be stable or to be growing. And that's been very important for us. Now, coming to your question, which was related to uh, how do we see this? I think the uh, new products are awaiting uh, inspection at site. There's been good progress on that. Uh, but until then, certainly we are going to look at growing the business through existing products, and that will come from uh, increased market share. So there is that uh, piece until we uh, get new approvals, we will uh, have to work through. One-offs, any, anywhere, whenever you have this kind of a transition, you do see that, um, and that is what we are seeing at this point. But business will, uh, uh, you know, will see changes as you see new products getting approved. And then, uh, then, like you asked, whether you will see that into a steady state and then moves to that steady state. And uh, when do we expect these new approvals, uh, Shriyas? Would it be, you know, uh, this, you know, second half of FI 25, 26? I mean, what's your sense on when do we eventually see yeah. this approval given the long wait already? Yeah, no, I, I wish I had a, a, a more firmer answer for this. Uh, as, as Peter uh, rightly alluded to earlier, uh, we've made good progress in terms of how uh, you know we've approached the agency, there's conversation going on, and <clears throat> um, and Rhonda can uh, can elaborate later in uh, in the discussion. She's our chief operating officer. I think at this stage we are at a point where we've um, we are awaiting uh, the FDA to come at site and inspect us, and we should be able to move this forward. Uh, there is no outstanding uh, question on the science. There is nothing that uh, that that part is pending. So once we get past that and schedule that inspection, and now we should be in a better position to answer that question. Understood. And sort of sorry, I'm going to squeeze in one more. You know, if I look at the uh, BBL net debt to EBITDA, you know, we're tracking you know over four times net debt to EBITDA. Uh, you know, what's the sense of the net debt reduction path that we have? Uh, you know, for BBL and what's our comfort level? Let's say twelve months from now. So. Yeah, maybe I'll take that one um, to start. Clearly, we've identified 
strengthening the balance sheet and debt reduction as a priority. Um, as I said earlier, we've reduced that by $200 million in the quarter. It will remain a focus um, at the levels that we have. We're comfortable at a BDL level and BL level, but clearly we'll be working our way to reduce that over the coming quarters. Understood. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Neha. Uh, we'll take the next question from Devendra Karan from HSBC. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My question is again on biosimilars. So you obviously are seeing good contract wins in some of the key launches. So I just want to understand uh, the pricing part of these contracts also, whether uh, we are gaining volume, but how is the scenario on the pricing part? Because competition definitely has uh, region in all the products. So that's uh first question. And then uh, what kind of discussions uh, you are undergoing currently for Adalimabab? I guess uh, maybe for next, uh, not for this year, but for future. And what are the key queries which you might be getting from your channel partners and uh, which you believe can help you to gain uh, better access there? So that's my first question. Thank you, Damianti. Um, again, I'm going to ask Srihas and Matt um, to to answer th those questions. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Maybe, Matt, if we can start that and then I can add on to this. Um... Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Look, I think it's important we start, uh, let me explain in the U.S. a little bit from a standpoint of what we've actually seen in market share and growth. And I'll explain to you uh, in during this time the pressures uh, that we're seeing in winning these. But for our Fafilla, if you remember, we're, we're at that 19% market share, which is up 12% over the last month. Uh, so we've seen a great run in our market share and potentially new player with even potentially new players coming into the market, as well as we're seeing Ogivri, we're seeing wins in that opportunity. Uh, when it's in the part B, Part B deflation is much slower because the way in the U.S. it's attributed to the ASP. So this business continues to have pricing pressures, which we're seeing if uptake in addition to volume in which we're winning in our fulfilla in our givery. But our number one piece of this is to make sure we're looking at price optimization and not driving this down as we prepare for additional uh, products within our oncology space. Let me also remind you on the insulin glargine side, which is the part D, we've seen great progress in the market share. As Peter uh, alluded to, even though you're seeing that 12%, a couple key things there is that closed door network or pharmacy that attributed, attributes additional about three to 4% in the overall growth of our insulin glargine. The second piece of this is we've had two large payer wins that started at the beginning of this year, that's going to add additional uh, opportunities within uh, our insulin portfolio. We're also anticipating in the insulin portfolio, after uh, everyone knows of the WAC uh, reset that we saw by the large insulin players, we're anticipating the pricing of this during through the next year to hold pretty steady. Um, as you had asked about adalidumab, uh, we are seeing wins. We're seeing them steadily progress. It's about 10% of the total U.S. lives, and we continue to see this uh, opportunity primarily in some commercial, as well as in managed Medicaid and Medicaid FFS. And so these are continuing. As you know, the bidding cycle is starting, uh, especially for adalidumab with what has been announced by CVS Health, and those aspects. Let me comment too on Europe real quickly, and then I'll turn it over to Shrias. We've seen nice growth in our uh, Bevcivimab uh, and also continued growth in our PEG as we look at tenders and opportunities in our retail sector. That's adding on to our strong position already uh, with our Adali uh, in Germany as well as in France. So hopefully that was clear on answering your questions there, but I'll Turn it back over to Srihas for more clarity or any other insights. No, thanks, Matt. I think it was pretty comprehensive. Um, I'll hand it back to um, to, to the question board. 
thank you for uh, the explanation. Uh, my second question is on uh, update on Malaysia plant. So uh, what are your expectations and what kind of timeline we should be looking uh, for resolution of issues there? And uh, it, just like another question on Pevasuji map. So uh, do you think it's still a meaningful opportunity for you to pursue given uh, we are like seeing delay in approval and launch there? So I think um, perhaps Rhonda, you can lead on the Malaysia question and um... Trihas, maybe you can pick up on the Beva question. Yeah, Rhonda, go ahead. Thank you very much, Peter and Trihas. Yes, so the Malaysia facility is um, now awaiting a re-inspection from the FDA. We have been actively engaged with the FDA and uh, discussing with the agency on a number of occasions. We are patiently waiting for them to arrive for the inspection. We're ready. Uh, in terms of the Bevacism map question that you had asked, I think Rhonda can respond to that as well. I think we are in that same uh, position that she just described uh, for the for, for Malaysia as well, where uh, we filed everything, we um, we do not see any questions on the on the signs, and we are uh, waiting for uh, the agency to uh, to come and inspect us. So that's where we stand uh, at this point. But still, a meaningful opportunity as for you to. Uh pursue it? Yes, certainly. I mean, uh, as part in, in the U.S. Uh, continues to be, uh, we continue to be the, the, the in the pole position with uh, with the opportunity to be the first interchangeable biosimilar as part uh, in the U.S. market. So clearly we, we remain excited there. And on Bevacism app, uh, Matt has uh, in the past alluded to um, the, uh, the uniqueness of the of the market, and all uh, well, there are clear opportunities for for those who come in early. There's also opportunity for uh, uh, for for companies which uh, can come in uh, at a deferred time point, given the way the Part B market is structured in the U.S. So, yes, I do not see us uh, being um, uh, you know uh, for a let me put this way, we see us being excited about both these products as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your response. Uh, thank you, Menti. We'll take the next question from Surya Mata from Philip Capital. Yeah, thanks, Aurav. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Uh, so my first question is on, uh, on the uh, BBL performance. So while we have seen uh, post-integration and all that, we have seen... Uh, ramp up in the market share for most of the biosimilar that is currently there on market. But uh, in terms of the revenues, it looks like that like-to-like uh, uh, -like basis, we have seen uh, a downward trend only. And uh, particularly this quarter, uh, if I adjust for the one-off gains, see then it looks like it is a loss-making operation while this is the biggest component of our business. So, uh, my question is that, uh, so till the time that we are not seeing incremental revenue from the newer pipeline, so should you be worried about the performance of the BBL uh, in the near term? Um, let me ask Kada to pick up on the financials on that first, and maybe Sri Asi and I can comment uh, once Sri, once Kada has uh, addressed the the core of the question. Thanks, Peter. So, Surya, uh, I think your feedback is, uh, we hear your feedback. See, there are two, three adjustments you need to make before you compute uh, steady state PBT margins. Firstly, the gain from uh, sale of brands in the revenue line is 350. But if you account for the costs and all the uh, items uh, for that, in the PBT, it's about 330. So, that's one adjustment you need to make. Secondly, in the SGN line, you will see a step up from quarter two to quarter three. Hmm. What has happened is this quarter across the countries, we had deployed multiple consulting, uh, uh, you know, experts and professional services <laughs> for IT, for people defining various SOPs, for regulatory, for customer service, invoicing and collections. So all of that is a, uh, you know, a chunky value, which has come in this quarter. So that's almost 5%. Okay. So, I mean, that is something that one needs to add. And if you see R&D, which is the third one, uh, please take a quarterly average 
hmm. this quarter is down 12 or 13 percent to revenue we don't spend at that at that rate so if you make these adjustments you will get to something which is more steady state and that will give you an appropriate idea as to the margin profile sure. so that's the right thing to look at it surya sure yeah uh, so for uh, just an extension to that uh, uh, we have also seen that uh, the company as well as the bbl signing a contract of uh, signing an agreement which is a equity support agreement uh, how should one read this whether it is indicating any challenge to bbl at the because of the upfront cost that is involved for the business or how should we really practically read it no in fact there is no cost to it surya see these are the letters which are provided by uh, parent to the subsidiaries and this kind of comfort letters uh, actually help to enhance the credit and negotiate on the cost of uh, capital actually so this is quite positive these are quite common where a parent gives this kind of letters to the subsidiaries okay just last one from my side uh, this is about uh, adelie mumar uh, see what we have understood from the various uh, uh, other uh, participant to the opportunity in the us so uh, they are commenting now adelie mumar is a opportunity of calendar 25 because uh, uh, even after signing contracts so nobody is expecting any great kind of a ramp up for adelie mumar so uh, is it fair to believe that this opportunity is getting extended or delayed to cy25 even for us um surya i i i start and shrihas please come in and 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 expand i i think the broad answer to your question is yes i mean it's it's very clear that the market for dalim mumab is is not going to open up in a big way in calendar 24 and the expectation is that that will happen in a more structured fashion in calendar 25 um the the opportunity perhaps has gone it's just been shifted in time a little bit and you know we are working hard uh, and and Matt can go to that and and we're making gains and wins in some of the contracts uh, you know it's going to be a slow build not a big bang and we're going to you know be building our position you know from a starting point to build a foothold and then from a foothold we will build on to that towards a stronghold so i think it is going to be a much slower evolution than than the market originally anticipated but i think that's a market phenomenon um more, more widely three has or matt do you want to add any other comment yeah no thanks i think peter that was uh, well well covered i just add one piece surya to this if you if you know what we had said even in the past that we see the market opening up in 23 but it will be 24 that you will start seeing some movement but it's really 25 that you will uh, really see the market opening up and the reason we had said this is because this is the first part d product that has lost exclusivity in that sense and it's a very large asset so there is this part of the us market that still uh, you know figuring out how this is to be done so we see this happening as more uh, commercial payers take the brand off and then biosimilar see um, a, a greater traction we've seen that happen in europe where uh, biosimilars have a sizable portion of the market uh, we've seen that happen in uh, the part b space in the us where, where many of the oncology products you're seeing more than 80% of the market move towards uh, biosimilars uh, that's not happened uh, with uh, with the part d drug which is in the immunology space and we will we were expecting to see that anyway in 25 but a greater extent uh, will will start showing as more products come into this space uh, that i would i would just add that to what peter said but otherwise i think peter's response quite comprehensive yeah sure thank you wish you all the best Thank you, Surya. We'll be taking the next question from Sham Srinivasan from Golden Sachs. uh yeah good morning uh, thank you for taking my question uh, just the first one on uh, semgly and the competitive dynamics around it right i think your 
your uh, press release talks about uh, unbranded glagine along with assembly at 12% and then there is an i think a 3-4 percentage point on top of that uh, just correct me if i'm getting those numbers wrong uh, but just want to understand when we look at the pipeline for 2024 calendar year i think uh, two chinese uh, insulin uh, guys are likely to be in the market and i know they have different front ends like sandos i think and king friend so what do you think about the or how do you think about the competitive landscape for Semgly? Uh, is there uh, still upside? Sorry, I missed the opening remarks. Have we signed some more contracts on Semgly specifically? Hi, Sharm, uh, uh, and thanks thanks for the question. Maybe Matt, you could pick up um, on on the sort of competitive um, position and and, uh, and our position, and again, sure he has you pick up as well on any any additional aspect. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, to your question, we're, we're continuing to see progress, nice progress with our market access with insulin glargine. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, we have won and uh, secured two large payers that started 1-1 of 2024. Uh, we are very closely, we watch any competitor uh, movement or possibility. Uh, we remain determined. Uh, diabetes is our franchise. Uh, we will be competitive. Uh, if these folks launch, we do have, remember in the U.S., we have uh, significant agreements. Now, can these payers open them up? Possibly, but it's also timing based on formulary. Uh, and they're normally one year. So uh, as, as you mentioned, these two new competitors that could possibly, they're not here today, but uh, we are absolutely uh, planning to move forward. We defend our portfolio in other areas, and we plan on defending our portfolio if any new launches do occur. I do think that being the first to the market and establishing these relationships and the stickiness of our insulin and simply uh, in the marketplace holds well for us uh, as we look at these potential new competitors that could be coming into the U.S. market. Um. And sorry, Matt, this is a clarification. So what, how much percentage point should I be adding on top of the 12 uh, for this closed door pharmacy? Uh, uh, we're, we're estimating between 16 and 17%. And then as compliance continues to ramp up, sure. uh, but currently right now between 16 and 17 for our uh, fiscal year, as we see these runs rates increasing. Helpful. Uh, just the second question is on the uh, generic side of things. Um, you know, I think the readout talks about pricing pressure on the uh, API side. Uh, if we could get an update on, uh, you know, I think we had earlier aspirations to grow double digit, but uh, we seem to be struggling. So it's just an update on the generics, please. Thanks again, Shahzad. Can you pick that one up? Yeah. <clears throat> so Sham, uh, yes, I mean, we, we are looking at uh, 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 double digit growth. Uh, unfortunately, in FY24, that looks unlikely. Uh, you know, we our formulations business is uh, doing very well in the US and in other markets. We have started receiving approvals. We have started launching these products, and that's uh, driving a, a, a high double digit uh, growth. But unfortunately, we've hit some challenges in the API business, and uh, the pricing pressure in the US and other markets continue to. Be a challenge, and uh, that uh, of course impacts the offtake uh, from our customers. And I think uh, that, that we definitely believe that this is just temporary because we are working on necessary steps like cost reduction, bringing in more operating efficiencies to be more competitive for some of our synthetic products. And uh, directionally, uh, I do not see any challenge, and we should be able to get back to the mid teens uh, kind of growth level in the next fiscal. And I, I think Peter did mention earlier that, uh, of course, there's a lot of focus on peptides and we do see that uh, starting next uh, fiscal year, uh, we should uh, start seeing this uh, revenues of uh, coming in from peptides. Uh, so that's a little confusing here because any formulation company we talk to is talking about US generic being actually in a sweet spot, like low single digit. Roshan, is our portfolio so dramatically different that we are seeing these price erosion even now in like first quarter calendar of 2024? Yeah, so I think from a, I think what you've heard is correct, uh, that there is stability in the US market. Uh, as I mentioned, that, that we have also gained a market share and new business for our formulations business. 
But when it comes to the API, uh, which of course API customers uh, have options uh, buying from us versus other competitors. And that's where we are seeing a little bit more stringent competition uh, where there are a lot of capacities, the Indian companies, the Chinese API suppliers have created, and there is a bit of a price <clears throat> uh, uh, war, I would say, uh, between these companies uh, and the generic formulation companies while they are uh, winning the business. Uh, they are, of course, passing on the pressure or the heat to the API suppliers. Okay. Um, just last question and I'll stop. Uh, is just on the deleveraging plan, again, just going back to an earlier participant, uh, just trying to understand the acknowledgement that we, when we reduce the 200 million uh, net debt number, is it an acknowledgement that our current cash flows are slower than anticipated, which is why we have to do these divestments? Is there more that we need to think of shareholding in Sinjin? I'm, I'm just throwing it all in there. But how should we look at the path ahead? Uh, thank you. Let me start. And then Indranil um, <clears throat> said you may want to come in. So as I said in my opening remarks, I mean, clearly looking at the balance sheet is, is a focus. Um, you know, that you can see that in the last quarter, we've reduced acquisition-related debt in BBL by 200 million. Uh, you know, we want to reduce it further and, and we will be looking at, um, you know, a range of options. Clearly, cash flow will be one from the operations and you know, that will be a focal point. But there are other um, options that we could employ as well. Um, Sham, it's going to remain a focus. We're going to look to bring it down. Cash flows from operations would clearly be, you know, a a, a preferred way to do it uh, and then we'll be focusing on that but there'll be others as well thank you and all the best thank you thank you Sean. thank you Sean. the next question is from Nipul Kumar Shah from Kumar Investments please go ahead hi thanks for the opportunity just wanted to know uh, this contractual arrangement to win million dollars. So what is regarding any I'm I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear the question at all. Sorry? Sorry, uh, Vipal Kulma. I, I can't hear your question. You're going in and out on the audio. So my question is regarding this contractual arrangement of two hundred twenty million dollars, I think your opening remark. What is this regarding? Right. Uh, this is regarding a contractual receivable arrangement that, that we had um, that's matured. Uh, and because of the confidential nature of the arrangement, we, we can't disclose any further details. Okay. And uh, uh, I want net debt figure, including a structural instrument. Possible again. I, I'm not hearing the question. I want net debt figure, including structural and uh, structural instruments at BBL level. I see. Okay, Andrew Neil, um, can, can you address that? Yeah, I, I think the number at BBL level is uh, uh 1.2 billion dollars, so and there could be another. Uh, 100 million dollars of structured so around 1.3 would be the number Kedar, i think uh, that's directionally right right yeah so we pull we can connect offline uh this number is in line with what we disclosed as debt so uh for for the structured uh we, we have to understand what do you mean by structured debt or structured equity i think let's take it offline but this 1.2 is in line with what is classified on balance sheet as debt my last question is what should be the cumulative integration cost? Because it is coming every quarter. So uh, till uh, so from the date we acquired this Beatrice business, what should be the cumulative total integration cost? So that we can have some idea what is going on. So Vipul, we don't have that number handy with us. As I mentioned, this quarter, by virtue of multiple uh, contractual arrangements for many activities, which were important to integrate uh, ahead of time, that number is roughly 5% to revenue of PBLs. 
But cumulative number, we don't have it handy. Again, that uh, we can take it offline. So should I contact offline? Yes, yes, please. Mr. Kedar, right? Yes, yes, we will. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Rupal. Uh, we'll take the next question from Prashad Manubhaya from Uttara Lusya. Please go ahead. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, Prashad. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. So just one more clarification on uh, the notes. Uh, the impairment is uh, with respect to of uh, almost 380 crores is with respect to which product? I can take that, Peter. So, uh, uh, Tushar, this is with respect to uh, RHI for the US. So currently we have paused this program because we feel pretty excited about the opportunity of SPART and other analogs. So since we have paused it as required under the standards, we have taken this impairment charge. Uh, and there have been, as you know, policy pronouncements and things like that. So I think our prioritization for analogs has required us to take this as required under the accounting. Uh, so that's the charge. But Shriyas, okay. if you could follow, please. Yeah. No, I think Kedar, you covered it. If there's any clarification, I can provide. No, so that's that's fair. And uh, secondly, on, even the provisioning is also there <clears throat> with respect to certain product. Uh, if you could also comment on which product are we taking this provision of See, we are calling out, Tushar, we are not calling out products. This this was the inventory which was acquired uh, as part of the acquisition, and uh, th these are not expired products. But our assessment of the pending shelf life and the ability to liquidate again has required us under the standards to create a provision. So it's pertaining to the inventory which was acquired. And uh, you know this is exp you know approaching expiry, but it's not yet expired. So we still have some chance to liquidate, but on a conservative basis, we have provided in this court. Understood, sir. And just lastly, uh, given that certain potential approvals because of inspections are getting delayed, but we do have multiple contracts. And at the same time, certain price erosion because of competition. Uh, in fact, quarter over quarter, if I exclude Aries uh, uh, income, uh, the biosimilar sales has been stable to slightly declining. So given these circumstances, how to think about growth, uh, particularly for biosimilars business over next uh, uh, next 12 to 15 months? I have Shri has done to you. Thanks, thanks, Peter. I think the the first piece that I would uh, look at here is that um, going forward, particularly we see opportunity in the existing products growing through market share. We talked in the earlier part of this call about uh, awaiting new approvals due, you know, due to the inspection delays. So while we await that, what we are very uh, focused on is to grow with the business through increased market shares. And I think that is what you are seeing at this point, uh, Tushar, where almost all our products in, in every geography that you see is gaining market share. So that is one aspect of it. The second aspect that you should see uh, is what uh, Matt talked about earlier is in Europe, where earlier the business was focused uh, only on a couple of countries with, with one or two products. I think the focus will be to see now that we have approval in Europe, with seven of our biologics uh, biosimilars, we would look to see a uh, two-fold uh, strategy there. One is to see if we can penetrate the, the couple of countries that we are present in with more products. And second is to see if we can widen our reach beyond the two countries into the uh, at least the big five or the EU five. Uh, the only piece I will put there is that our uh, uh, control of the European uh, business is a month old. So uh, Matt and the European leadership is putting that commercial strategy in place, but that is how we are uh, going to be looking uh, forward to grow the business even as new products come into the fold. Sure, sir. Thanks, thanks a lot for addressing the queries. Thank you, Nishar. Uh, the next question is from Pranav from Red Enterprises. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, can can you just uh, highlight uh, about out, about the debt that we have taken for Beatrice? Uh, how uh, you referred to it that thirty percent of it is fixed rate, thirty percent of it is 
uh, payable and 30% of it is uh, hedged in last quart quarterly con call. So can you just uh, uh, let us know what is the reset time and has the interest rate actually come to uh, current interest rates? Uh, that is one. And also the is interest payments in that uh, actually going to affect our various other research programs? Uh, because uh, if we just remove one of them uh, and uh, include the expenses that we have uh, incurring in BBL, then actually uh, BBL margin looks negative. So I know there are many one-offs. So how are we going to manage cash programs? Because I fear that it can affect our other research programs. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks. Um, kind of let me perhaps, Indranil, you can address the first question on the interest rates related to the, the debt. And I think Shri has you already touched on um, you know, how we're looking at uh, uh, one-off costs related to transition, freeing up, uh, you know, further margin going forward. And maybe you can follow up on that part of the question. But Indranil first on, on, the, on the interest rates, please. Yeah, so I'll cover a part of it and let uh, Kedar maybe confirm some of the facts. But from an interest rate perspective, our acquisition rate was somewhere around 6%. Uh, the current market environment, uh, we still see uh, the SOFOR levels pretty high. And, and while there's a, in, there are indications of tapering down, at, at current market levels, they're hovering around 7%. Uh, but there are indications uh, with IRS that this could come somewhere around 5.5%. And, .5%. and uh, so our current rate profiles are still kind of uh, at, at, at that level. I'll let Kedar confirm in terms of the strategy that we have uh, in terms of the mix of our data and how do we plan to hedge the balance? Yeah, so you're right, Indranil. Mm -hmm. I think the SOFR link facility, and as the SOFR moves, obviously the effective uh, rate that we have gets addressed. So uh, so that's fine. And uh, yeah, while there's an indication that there'll be a reduction, current rates are high. But uh, let's wait for the news on the six to nine months. Uh, so that's on the rate and the way you know we capture interest on the books. Uh, uh, Sorry, what was your next question? Uh, I think the second part of the question was looking at the BBL margin opportunity for it, for expansion. Um, I, and I think Yas has covered it both in terms of looking at the, uh, the, the growth of existing products and existing markets and existing products in new markets, and also the recognition that in this quarter there is a as Kadar's explained, you know, roughly 5% of revenues that's related to one-time, one-off costs related to completing the, this accelerated uh, transition. Right. So my question is that, uh, is cash flows uh, limiting our development and product uh, research programs? Are we pausing something so, that prior, so, so as to prioritize something else? Also, um, just just uh, uh, is is existing biosimilar uh, products facing a pricing pressure uh, so that the revenue QOQ is a little bit less than expected in spite of volume ramp ups. Thanks, thanks a lot. So that's it. Sure. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I think perhaps you, you can start on that. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Peter. And I think Pranav, that's uh, I've, I've consistently talked about this even in the past. That pricing is is always an outcome of market competition. And you will see, uh, you know, competition uh, challenge pricing in the market as products mature. Uh, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, that kind of a behavior where uh, where you've seen a very mature price erosion on the, on the medical benefit side in the U.S. And you've seen that hold steady for the last five, six years. We are seeing a reasonable price erosion over a period of time. You've seen very different behavior on Part D product, where you've seen the first such product uh, in Adalimumab, uh, which lost exclusivity. So very different behavior, same market, uh, different influencers. And, and that is going to happen given there is competition. Now, whether that is uh, that is reflective of what will continue to happen going forward. I, I think one of the things we should be prepared for is competition will challenge pricing. The uh, key thing to look out for, which Matt talked about earlier, is policy changes. And those are the ones that can 
dramatically change how pricing is looked at. Uh, IRA in the US is one such uh, policy change that has recently come into play, uh, which of course changed the uh, in insulin landscape uh, starting 1-1-24, where uh, the, uh, the administration talked about uh, $35 copay for any insulin, no matter which product it is. So some of these things we need to look out for and the business needs to have the resilience to um, uh, to be able to combat this. And that's where our, our strength in portfolio, our strength in process development, our strength in uh, having done this for a long period of time and now more importantly being fully integrated gives us the levers to actually combat this. And there will be quarterly aberrations which I've said even in the past should should normalize over a period of time. But yes, it does, uh, you know, it will require you to look at uh, a broader horizon. Ron, does it answer your question? I think Yash or something sort of, uh, I think we probably responded. Uh, uh, we'll move to the next caller. Uh, the next question is from Yash Tana from Micro Advisory. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is uh, on the BBL IPO, uh, if we can have an update on the same, uh, on the timelines of the IPO, or uh, and uh, are there any prerequisites uh, that we need to fulfill before uh, we have to go ahead with the IPO? So that's that's a question. Uh, thanks, Yash. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, Sri has uh, spoken about the IPO time and timing on several occasions, but um, Sri has perhaps you could uh, um, emphasize it emphasize again. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, yes, thanks for your question. I think one of the things that uh, that I've always talked about is that it is uh, there are certain things that are very critical to focus on right now is to create value for all stakeholders. And one of the key things after we went uh, through the um, large acquisition that we did is was to make sure that it was not just acquiring the business but gaining control of all the business uh, across the countries which we didn't have and we were operating under a tsa and uh, it was important that even before we talk about any ipo we first focused on gaining control across all geographies it was a two-year tsa we focused on gaining control as soon as possible so we can we can be in better control of our destiny so that is now complete as of last quarter, now uh, we are we are now in um, uh, able to make our own decisions, have full visibility going forward, even though it's just one month old today. The second thing is uh, from a prerequisite that you asked. I think it is extremely important that we focus on the FDA approvals. Uh, this is an enabling provision which allows us to uh, unlock value in the portfolio that we have been investing in, and I think it has dodged us for quite some time. <laughs> Which, uh, which I think all the leadership has been very focused on, engaged with the agency, and uh, we are awaiting them to come and uh, inspect us. So we are very uh, focused on making sure that uh, we have the FDA unlocked before we, uh, we talk about that. The third very critical piece is we need to move from an integration acquisition phase to a more consolidate and grow phase, which is how our strategy has been focused. First was to preserve value, and you heard uh, Peter talk about it, that we have focused on business continuity, not dropped any customer, uh, any order, any patient supplies. So that was first. Now we consolidate the business, bring it to, the, to a steady state, so we don't have these one-offs that we are talking about uh, at this stage. And then we can then talk about what is the appropriate time for an IPO and, and and Peter and the leadership team, we can all all discuss what that uh, would be. But I would I would lay out some of these things as as very important for us to focus on uh, in the near term priorities that bi on biologics. Peter, back to you. Yeah, no, I think you've covered that. Um, Shri has. I think you know clearly we we would look at an IPO, you know, when when we have the right. Uh, story and shape, and a big part of that is going to be related to, uh, you know, momentum and that we have with existing products and existing markets. And as Shri has and the team have described pushing that into new markets, 
Um, of course, new products is going to be a big driver, and that relates to Sri Hass's comments on the regulatory timeline. So, you know, we'll we'll be looking at that through those lenses. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we take the next question from Harit Ahmed from Avengers Park. This will be the last question for this call. Hi. Uh, good morning. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so my first question is on a stickinumab uh, filing. Previously, we had talked about uh, uh, completing the filing for this in the near term. Uh, so any update there? Thanks, Harith. Um, I, I think that's a question either for uh, uh, Sri Hass or Rhonda. I think the answer Harith, to that is yes. So uh, we've, we've completed the filing. Okay. Um, and and second one is on the integration related costs that we've uh, seen in this quarter as part of other expenses. Uh, you called out that this is roughly 5% of uh, Biocon Biologics revenue. So uh, can we assume this is a one-off and, and uh, to this extent, we'll see an improvement in Biocon Biologics uh, EBITDA margins uh, starting fourth quarter? So Harit, I would be... Sorry, Peter, if I can take the question. So I think uh, for uh, doing margin analysis of the quarter, those two, three adjustments, Harit, which I refer to, I think that you should consider. So the gain in the PNL, not in the revenue line, on the sale of brands is about 330-ish. Yeah. That is, SGN is 5%. R&D, just take an quarterly average rather than this quarter, because this quarter is slight bump up. So that will give an idea about the margin of this quarter. And... Uh, with respect to steady state margins, we would like to be in the same range, right? And uh, your question is whether 5% will go up. It will go up next quarter. The question is whether we have to invest on that something else. So I think we would like to reserve our comment on that part. But for this quarter's margin analysis, I think these are the adjustments that you need to make. Okay, got it. And and uh, uh, Shreyas, on the RH insulin comment that you made that uh, we have suspended our uh, activities there, uh, so a bit surprised, uh, given that we've completed uh, trials and we've done a filing there, uh, and and uh, I see that it's a fairly large opportunity and and with uh, very limited visible uh, competition uh, out there. So uh, can you explain uh, a bit more on the thought process there? Yeah, no fair question, Harith, and and uh, Kizar did talk about it in the beginning. The the color that I would like to provide on that is, see, we've been always very committed to insulins globally, particularly in the US as well. And uh, today, if you look at it, Glargin has been a big success. We are seeing ASPART at a point where we are awaiting inspection. So the science has been well developed. <clears throat> uh, we've also seen our uh, RH insulin where we have, uh, it's not one product, uh, it's three different products. We've filed for uh, insulin R. There is also insulin NPH. There is also insulin seventy thirty, which is a mix. And you have to develop all three as different products and um, do clinical trials for all of them. At least phase one, phase three, we have a waiver right now. Now, once you've done that, that three products put together is roughly a little under a billion as a franchise in the U.S. Now, in light of the recent policy uh, changes, which I talked about to a previous question. I think it's important to see how this shapes up and which is why we have paused that, like Kedar said, because right now the policy advisory is that it's $35 no matter which insulin uh, is prescribed as a copay. So we just want to make sure that, uh, that we understand this. We see how the market evolves. We have two great products in that uh, market. Uh, you heard Matt talk about us gaining market share, gaining customers. So we first want to capitalize on the investments we made before we uh, embark on further development and take on further costs. I think that is really the rationale. Okay, uh, got it. Uh, thanks for that. And last one with your permission on, on our B3 facility. Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, whether uh, we've started commercial supplies from there? I, I understand that we have a EU GMP certification for the facility. But uh, in terms of uh, US FDA timelines and our supplies to the US, uh, can you comment a bit? From Shreyas, B yeah. Peter. Shreyas, do you want to comment on that? Yes, thanks, Peter. I think the uh, uh, the B3 facility is, is an exceptional facility, Harit. It was awarded the um, ISP Facility of the Year Award. So it's really a 
one of uh, one of the uh, you know uh, acknowledged awarded facilities in the country for biologics it has been uh, approved and we continue to supply product from that facility uh, to europe and, and several other parts of the world we are awaiting um, the uh, agency to inspect us so that we can supply to um, to to uh, us as well from this facility but i will let ronda comment on this just a little just so that you know you get a flavor because she has been the one leading this uh, entire operations effort so over to you ronda Thank you, Shriyas. Yes, the B3 facility is definitely something that we're really keen to make sure that we actually utilize for the U.S. also. However, it's not a, it's not a case that we're not utilizing it. It's certainly uh, very active and very much used right now in terms of supplying um, uh, trastuzumab, bevacizumab uh, to the rest of the world. So um, it's a uh, very... Uh, very much in use, very much active in that sense. And of course, we need to approve every new facility for use in whichever region it actually is. And we are awaiting that inspection from the FDA for the site in Bangalore so that we can actually put it into use for the US also. But remember, we have B1 very much active in terms of supplying the US. So there's neither a, a challenge to actually supply, nor is there a delay in actually utilization of the facility overall. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. Thank, uh, thanks. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you, Harit. Uh, that was the last question for the day. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. If there are any further questions or clarification you need, please do end up with us. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank